Hey, welcome back to Willow Vikit. My guest today is Penny Jane Swift, who is the uh, museum manager at Shaftesbury Abbey in Dorset. I want to say Dorset. Yes, it's in Dorset. <laughs> <laughs> Just. Just. <laughs> Very close to the Wiltshire border. So what is it you do here? So here at the Abbey, um, it, it's a museum. So it's in a ruin of an Abbey. Um, so here we try and tell the story of life in the museum and what was here. So the first abbey was built in 888 by King Alfred the Great, who's oh, well, my favourite king. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's the only one called Great, so he's got to have been pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then it grew to be the richest, most influential nunnery in the whole of England. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat. <laughs> So how did we get to the point, we'll jump to the end a little bit, how did we get to the point where it's a ruin? Because I'm sure people are wondering why it's a ruin at the moment. Yeah, unfortunately Henry VIII happened. Um, as many people will know, dissolution of monasteries yeah. um, started in 1536 and our, our abbey itself was demolished in 1539. So it was one of the last ones to go. Mm. We think because Elizabeth Zoo, she was our last abbess, was actually related to Henry VIII uh, through her grandmother, I understand. Right. And um, so she managed to persuade him, tried to persuade him not to do this one. <laughs> you know, go on, let us keep ours. Go on, go on, yeah. go on. And in the end, it was like, no, no got to go. It went. And the chap called Thomas Arundel acquired the site and literally dismantled the church to reuse all the stone, early recycling, yeah. and built himself a palace instead. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> like you do. Yeah. So I think, uh, uh, if I understand correctly, you're not actually sure what the construction was, whether it was stone or timber. I know there's a lot of stone here. Yeah, the certainly the Saxon one would probably have started off as timber um, and then gradually been stoned, if, that, if that's a word. Gradually replaced. <laughs> yeah, replaced yeah. with stone. And then the last major, re well, the biggest rebuild was the Normans. Yeah. As soon as the Normans come in, they think, well, Saxon's poxy little church, we can do a bigger one than that. So they you know, build this huge church, and by the end, the Abbey Church here was over 90 metres in length. It's enormous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty so, huge. Yeah. Compared to this little one, we've got a little church just behind us now. <laughs> the Abbey would have been a lot bigger than that. Absolutely. Um, and, yeah, the tower on the church, the Abbey Church was twice the height of the tower behind us. So you've got to have had a huge, huge, huge walls to hold up a yeah. church like that. But it's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm right in thinking, Alfred put his daughter on site first. Yes. So the first abbess was Ethel Giffey, yeah. his daughter, um, who was around the age of 16 at the time, which obviously nowadays you think that's really young. Still a child, really, yeah. I think. Yeah. But when you think life expectancy in only 30 to 40 years, by the time you're 16, you're middle-aged, which is really scary. <laughs> that is scary. <laughs> um, yeah. she, she brought with her, I think I'm right in saying, about a dozen nuns when she came uh, from Wimborne, okay. which yeah. is uh, down near East Dorset area. Yes. Um, and uh, she was obviously the one of the youngest of them. Yeah. Um, I mean, she brought senior ones to help her um, as she grew used to be being an abbess, I suppose. Mm. Um, must have been quite a, quite a thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's a few other important figures related to the site as well, aren't there? There are. I mean, we've had, um, well, at the moment, Shaftesbury is situated on the A30. Basically, the London to Exeter Road. Yeah. Um, people still stop here. And when the Abbey was here, it was a stopping off point because all abbeys and monasteries had to offer hospitality. So it, it had guest houses yeah. and people would stop on their way through. Um, the most famous, of course, would probably be Catherine of Aragon, um, who came here on her way from Plymouth up to London to marry Prince Arthur. Not Henry. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, the other, I was trying to think, oh, Robert the Bruce's wife and daughter were kept here. Yeah. Yeah, and he was imprisoned. They were kept hostages here wow. in the Abbey. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. 
famous people. Yeah, and a few that came towards the end of their life and even after life, I think. So, Edward. So, yeah, the first one would be Edward the Martha. Yeah. King of England. Boy King. He died at Corfe. <laughs> he died, yeah, near Corfe Castle, although there wasn't a castle there at the time. Um, his mum, or his stepmom, decided that her son would make a better king. Right. Um, so she tried poisoning him. That didn't work. Lovely. So then she sent some men after him when he went out hunting and dragged him from his horse and put paid to him, shall we say. Um, two stories as to what happened to him after that. First is that he dropped his body down a well. Yeah. Second one, possibly more of a a story, shall we say, Yeah. was that his body was hidden in the hut of an old blind woman in the forest. Yeah. Um, and when his friends came the next morning and found the hut, the blind woman could see. Interesting. And that's the first it's miracle of St. Yeah. Edward. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so when a couple of years later his brother felt a bit bad about having <laughs> murdered his brother, his brother being murdered. Bit guilty. Bit guilty. Things weren't going well either because his brother's Ethelred the Unready. Not the best of our kings either. <laughs> Um, things weren't going well for him. The Danes were harrying yeah. the Wessex, so um, he had his uh, brother's body brought here to Shaftesbury to the Abbey and buried in the grounds originally. And then in the year 1000, when the Danes had beaten him down in Hampshire yeah. and were heading towards Exeter, the body, uncorrupted body, they say, um, hence his sainted, um, was brought into the Abbey Church and it stayed here and his bones stayed here until um, the late 1970s, early 80s. And then he got moved. And he was moved to Brookwood in Surrey. Okay, so that's where he is now? That's where he is now with the Brotherhood of St Edward. So you don't think they're going to let him come back at any point? <laughs> they said he could come back as long as they could come too. And we'd have to find somewhere for them to stay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Quite a task. Probably not. No. And one more. Yeah. King Canute. King Canute. King Canute. There's our Viking connection. That's our Viking connection. He fought the Saxons in a place called Gillingham, which is just north of here. And uh, um, the place is the actual battle site is now called Slaughtergate. Nice. And is the home of the North Dorset Rugby Club. Oh. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> is that the name of the rugby club? It's not. No, no. Um, so. Yeah, so he was injured during the battle. Yeah. And even though he was a pagan at that time, they still brought him here to the abbey to the nuns to be healed. And then obviously when he became King of Wessex and England, yeah. he converted to Christianity. And he gave quite a lot of money and land to the abbey as a thank you. Yeah. Um, and then when he, towards the end of his life, when he wasn't feeling very well, he came to see what the nuns could do for him. And unfortunately, there was nothing they could do. So he died here. He died here. Wow. Um, obviously, then he was taken to Winchester to be buried. Yeah. But there is a story that part of him was left, as they did sometimes in those days. Leave your heart somewhere or... Yeah. Um, yes. They think part of him may have been left in a glass vase, or a glass bowl, rather, which yeah. is one of the last existing English sets in glass bowls. And I think I've seen it in the museum. You've seen the, the picture in the... the rapid, yeah, yeah, picture yeah. of it, yeah. Uh, because the original one's in Winchester still at the moment. But we're hoping to get it back. It is quite <laughs> Brilliant. So, Penny, we'll move on to some food. So, I had to prepare your food yesterday, I'm afraid, so it's not fresh. That's fine. I'm, <laughs> given that they uh, had little or, um, refrigeration, shall we say, then yeah. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> so, what I've done is taken inspiration from the story of Alfred's Cakes. Which yep. I think you're sort of familiar with. Yeah. Um, so for those that don't maybe know, um, short version is Alfred is fighting against the Vikings down in Athelney. Yeah. Uh, the Somerset Marshes, he's hiding. Um, and he happens upon um, sort of a small cottage, I think it was, um, where there's a fisherman and his wife living. And the fisherman goes out for the day. Um, and Alfred is left in charge of what's sometimes referred to as cakes, sometimes bread, um, which is cooking in the fire. Presumably it's a poorer household, and so they, for some reason people say that they would have only had ovens if they were wealthy. I'm not sure about that one. Um, but So they're often referred to as ash bread. 
Oh, um, yeah. Because they would just be cooked in the embers. Um, so I've played with that idea, brought a few things along for you to try, and maybe we can discuss them and uh, we can decide which one we think maybe was most likely for the time for what maybe Alfred was eating. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so Alfred does unfortunately burn the ladies' cakes and she gives him a bit of a telling off. <laughs> The story, the story that he was so deep in thought about the strategy for the next battle. <laughs> There's variations. Sometimes they say he fell asleep because he was tired from war. Um, but whichever way, yeah, uh, the, the fisherman's wife comes in, has a go at him for, you know, she says something along the lines of, why is it that you can leave my cakes to burn um, and it is you that will eat them or something along those lines. Um, I've probably butchered that quite badly. <laughs> but uh, I think most people get the idea. Um but I believe it was written about 300 years after Asses. Um, so potentially it's a made-up story anyway. Whether it was to make him look more humble. It does seem to be the one that everyone remembers. It is. is. I'm not really sure why that would be. I think everybody remembers people making mistakes. Yeah. And maybe the humbleness of the fact that he lets the lady tell him off. Yeah. And he doesn't, doesn't tell him. Don't I'm your king. Him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As far as the story goes, he never tells her that he's the king. So that's true. Yeah, which makes you wonder. In his poshest outfit, either. No. <laughs> well, then it makes you wonder where the story, if it was true, where it would have come from, because yeah. there's two people in the room. Yeah. The fisherman's wife and Alfred, and as yeah. she doesn't know who he is, it kind of. Yeah. So yeah, it's probably made up. Um, we'll tuck into some bread and. Okay. And I will I'm looking forward to this. tell you some other things about it. That I've never tried your food before, so... That's always good. <laughs> <laughs> so, first off, I've made uh, black bread, which is basically bread, um, but with a little bit of blood mixed into it. So, mm -hmm. being resourceful, not wasting anything, they probably would have added things like blood to the bread. It's a good source of protein. Yep. There is um, a bread, I couldn't tell you where it was found, um, but it's been analysed and it does have protein in it. and I think general consensus is it's probably from something like blood being mixed in with, <laughs> with the, the dough. So what I've done, I, hopefully you can see this on the camera as well, I've got three versions. So the bigger one here, more traditional loaf, cooked in my oven at home. Yep. And then we've got two smaller ones, so more like a flatbread, which was cooked um, next to the fire, um, and then a very small roll, which was cooked in the embers, so possibly closer to what maybe Alfred would have been burning at the time. <laughs> they do look slightly burned, but um, what should we do? Should we? That's probably Start the. Start with that one, yeah. You can break that, can't you? Because they're all the same. They're all three of the same recipe. Okay, okay. If you need it, I've got butter and cheese to improve <laughs> the flavour. <laughs> you're not into it. That to start with, shall we? And sometimes we put. Too bad. We use the blood for sausages as well, mm -hmm. um, and even in pancakes. Yeah. Which I think is more of a Scandinavian idea. You can get them with um, beer and beer and blood and they almost taste chocolatey mm. that tastes good there is an almost chocolatey flavor to that mm. actually that's rather good so for a, something that wouldn't have existed at the time they wouldn't have compared it to chocolate no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah there well, is a sort of next time i go back in time and time travel <laughs> i'll know where to get my fix <laughs> so yeah that's one and it does I do it at events a lot because people see this black bread on the mm. table. It draws people in and sort of engages people mm. a little bit. Yeah. So it's a, yeah, it's a good one thing. Oh, no, that is that is rather good. We've got plenty more to eat, so yeah. you don't have to don't say, have to eat all of them. <laughs> can we have a try a bit of the bread, the loaf one, we can and see where, the what the difference is. From the, the bigger to... loaf. Oh, it's entirely up to you. Which would be a more modern one. I'm going to yeah. just see whether. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be too tough. No. If we just break a piece off, because I have got a knife, but. Okie dokie. Um, no. Because <laughs> it's less flat, it should have more of a modern bread texture. Yeah. Mm, it does, actually. It's more bready, if that makes sense. Lighter. Mm. Same flavour. Mm hmm. Which yeah. you'd expect. It's Richard the same. Expect, it's the same dough. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Gonna try with a bit of butter. Absolutely. And then you can sort of think, right, this is what I have for breakfast or whatever. Hmm. So whilst you're having some butter with that one, 
I'll explain to everyone about the other one. Okay, Dave. So the other more bready one that I've got um, is uh, spout flour mm -hmm. um, and a little bit of malt extract, which is a sweetener a lot of people don't really think about from the period. Everyone thinks of honey, um, but malt extract would have also been available because they were growing beer. Yeah. So it's another possibility. So I've done exactly the same thing. We've got a, a flatbread, which I must admit, <laughs> a little bit burnt on the bottom. So that's the that's Alfred. Separate though, surely. <laughs> I did toy with the idea of pretending that I meant to burn it, but no. <laughs> and then a small roll again, and then Unload. we've got a bigger loaf, which is slightly better looking than the, the, black, the one. black one. Doesn't look quite as appetising, although it tastes good. <laughs> this one smells a bit sweeter as well. well I um, like mal malty bread, so... Uh... So if we go down the same route, I think. Yeah. If we break the, the flatbread. Yeah. So this is a bit like the one you made when you came here last time. But I think I you fried them. I can't remember what I made last time. Yeah. <laughs> I've made a few things you since made, then. You made some very nice flat bread, but you fried it rather than ovening it. Oh, because mm. it, it was raining and... It was raining a lot. <laughs> it was raining a lot. I remember that. <laughs> mm. Mm, that's nice of it. It is sweet, actually. Mm. You wouldn't need to put marmalade or anything on this one. It's, mm. it's got sweetness already. Mm. That's pretty decent, I think. At the moment, I think I prefer that to the, uh, to the blood. Well, that one's it was, winning. It's all right, but... <laughs> well, at the end, you can rank them all, okay. if you like, um, and maybe decide which one you think is the most feasible, which what one? Alfred would have burned. Oh, fair enough. Maybe which that. one I'm taking home? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to try the bigger one as well? Or are you happy with I think, for now? Yeah, I think we'll leave it whole and then you can have it for your tea tonight. Alrighty. <laughs> <laughs> so then I've gone down... Um, oh, we do have one more bread actually before I mm -hmm. go down the slightly sweeter route. So these I'll admit, and anyone that's seen another video of mine with Jen last week, <laughs> these are crisp breads with caraway seeds. Okay. So they're basically dried out next to a fire. These were done in my oven, but you can also, hopefully, oh, they yeah, are about a week crisp. old, so they're crisp. If anything, they might be stale, but they sound crisp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little bit mm. hard. Mm, can really, really taste the caraway. Mm. So again, these could be baked in a dry pan, mm -hmm. um, or even just on a sort of a hot stone next to the fire. Yeah. Um, because they're basically just dried out flatbreads. Yeah. Now, I was asked on the previous one with uh, my other guest, Jen, how long these would keep for. And it was a bit, because we tend to eat them in the weekend that I've made them. Mm-hmm. Um, the week on, I think they're slightly stale. They are but it's still edible. Bit. Yeah. And the flavour's still good. I think what you possibly do is put it next to the fire again, just freshen it up. You could. In the microwave. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have microwaves in the white house? No, and no. unfortunately Shaftesbury Abbey doesn't have a microwave You haven't either. found one yet. Keep no. digging. Yeah. <laughs> oyster shells. Yeah? We found oyster shells. They yeah. ate those. That's interesting because I know particularly York, there's a lot of shellfish. Mm -hmm. And not as far as I was aware, there wasn't quite as much elsewhere. There's well, quite a lot here. Well, given that how far Shaftesbury is from the sea, mm. which is a good hour in a car <laughs> um the fact mm. that we get a lot of oyster shells up here but shaftesbury abbey owned land down near the sea so the tithe that would bet was paid yeah. would have been barrels of salt fish and oh. salt shellfish okay and that's how it gets up here yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> don't know there's a theory with york that it's probably roman influence because to have as the Roman army left, some of them would have stayed behind and been traded in shellfish, which would have then been sold to the Vikings and the Saxons, um, and maybe inspired their taste that way. Yeah. So, I don't know. Because I think in Scandinavia, there's almost zero evidence that they ate any shellfish, but the Vikings that came here did. Well, I suppose if you've got the Romans doing it, then obviously the Britons, yeah, who didn't go away when the Romans did, <laughs> would have carried on. And yeah, 
And if if they if they tasted good, then there's no point in not eating them, is there? And I guess there's different times when you're hungry and stuff. Where you know, if someone says eat this, you're going to eat it. Yeah. You? Even if yeah. you're, what the hell is that? That's uh... um, just like me. Mm. <laughs> <Try anything. laughs> okay, so we've got two more. Yep. Um, so these are oat cakes. Oat cake. So it's oats um, and butter. Mm hmm. Uh, a little bit of salt. Um, and then they're just fried in a frying pan. Um, yeah, that's it, really. So they don't have a plausible. He would have needed a frying pan to make these. Mm. Which we do have evidence for. Mm -hmm. Not from that story, but... <laughs> mm. Those are nice. Those are really nice. I think when I posted the recipe for these on my YouTube channel, there was a comment underneath that said, eat like a Scottish Highlander, rather than eat like a bike. Yes, I can, I can see that, because they still eat... Mind you, if the oat cakes that you purchase these days that are Scottish oat cakes are anything to go by. I'm going with these ones. This tastes like flapjack. <laughs> Lovely. Not it's quite as sweet. sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But... Yeah, so they're, they're sort of, um, you dry fry them in the pan because mm -hmm. there's enough butter in the, mm. the cake themselves. Um, you can do them in the oven. But, um, they work just as well in a frying pan. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. But if you like sweet things, I've also made a, a more of a cake because a lot of people refer to Alfred's cakes. That's good. We do think of them as being cakes for some reason. All the older versions of the story do seem to reference them as being an ash bread. So I think this personally is the least likely. <laughs> yeah, so the last one we've got is um, a version of something from my book. So usually I use soft fruits, but because it's not that time of year for that sort of thing, I thought it would be a bit more authentic. Okay. So I've got some chopped apple, some walnuts, mm -hmm. Some malt extract for a bit of sweetness. Okay. Um, and then some oat flour. Ooh. Um, okay. So, yeah, so these are a bit more like a cake, which is what people often refer to Alfred's cakes. Yep. Um, oh, yeah, softer. They were probably breads because all the early references mention ash breads. Mm -hmm. But just as a an outlier, I thought I'd put it in there. Maybe yeah. we can see what you think. Um, personally, I think it's the least likely of the bunch. I think you're probably right, but it's very tasty. And as a person who's not actually keen on walnuts, it tastes really good. You're eating it anyway. <laughs> mm. This is actually, the, I didn't even taste these yesterday. I thought I'd leave it mm -hmm. for today. And as I, I normally make them with berries, but apple and walnut is good. It is good. Mm. And I think straight off the fire, even better. Nice and warm. Mm. Mm. Mind you, that might be just because we're outside and in. It's November, a little bit chilly. <laughs> <laughs> and again, these are just done in a frying pan. Mm -hmm. So if Alfred were to make these, he would need a frying pan. Yeah. Which maybe in a poorer household, as suggested from the story, he wouldn't have had. Mm, no. Mm. But he might have done. Might have had a. Um, I can't remember the word now. It begins with S K. Skillet. That's the one. Yeah, skillet. Oh, you do have the. There's a smaller pan. Um, with like a pin in the middle that's fairly common okay. but i mean most ironware would be quite expensive mm. um it is suggested that they were cooked in the embers of the fire so i think i think your ash bread idea is probably the i think the ash bread yeah. is most likely of the luck mm -hmm. mm. what, are, what are we thinking do you want to rank them oh, okay it's gonna go in order of sweetness or... <laughs> <laughs> in order of which i'm gonna eat most of mm. well in fact i to be honest i would eat any of those and happily eat any of those um so i think probably you need like caraway ones yeah but i'm not quite sure why mm. then the blood bread then the bread bread <laughs> malt, that was malt a malt loaf. Yeah. Was malt we call it malt loaf. Malt loaf. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I think my so my favourite is this one. So that leaves the oat cakes as so almost favourite. Yeah, yeah. They're almost in the order I fed them to you. They are, <laughs> and also they're all the order sweetness. <laughs> Inadvertently. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess no one's going to be surprised by which one you think is probably most likely that Alfred might have been making. Well, given that it was a fisherman's house, I think it's probably going to be the malt bread. 
the milk bread. So probably, I mean, we had the three versions. Mm. So probably not a bigger loaf, but you no. either a small flat bread. Either, yeah. Or one. these, which would be more like the ash bread. I think the yeah that one, which was yeah, mm. going the ashes. Does seem the most likely. Yeah. So as we said before, the story is about three hundred years after, you know, the main writings of Alfred's. Um, so we don't really know where it came from. Mm -hmm. Did you know that it was possibly plagiarised? It might have been taken from the Vikings? No. So there is an, an earlier story um, from the Saga of the Volsungs. Okay, yeah. Which is sort of like the prequel to the Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, the probably most famous, most sort of people that aren't into history probably aware of Ragnar. Mm -hmm. And his sons particularly. Yeah. Um, so there is a story. Um, I've forgotten the lady's name, but basically his ship pulls up and he sends his men onto the land to go and make some dinner. And they find a, a small cottage or a farmhouse and they go inside and there's a man there and his daughter. And so say the daughter was really beautiful. So first off, they insult the father by saying, how the hell is that your daughter? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Was they writings of the time, but that's been <laughs> that's working yeah. for you. <laughs> like, is she really your daughter? Have you seen her? Yeah, that's kind of the modern equivalent. Yeah. Um, and so then they decide that being as she's there, she may as well help them make the food. So they set her to work to make some dough, mm -hmm. which they then cook. And unfortunately, she's so beautiful that they get distracted and burn the bread. And so they return to their ship. And they dish out these burned breads and Ragnar is sort of, you know, what are you thinking? You've burned our bread. And um, they sort of say, no, 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 it wasn't our fault. You see, there was this really beautiful lady um, and we got distracted. And he doesn't believe them. So he goes to find out himself. And of course, he agrees with them. Um, he later marries her. And she's the mother of uh, Ivar the Boneless and all the other famous Viking marauders that come to England. So there is a theory, and I don't know how many people believe it, but there's a theory that that story is where they took the Alfred the Great one from. But no, that does not see the possibility. They are quite different stories. They are pretty different, though. <laughs> the, other than the burned bread. I mean. yeah. <laughs> burned bread, fire. I think that's probably as near as they are. Yeah. But, uh, interesting concept, though. Yeah. I mean, it's only something I read about just in the last couple of weeks, but... Um, I don't know how I've, I've over sort of missed that before because mm. I have read the the Volsung. Excuse me, I have read the Volsungs before, but um, for some reason I missed the burn. Break. Yeah, but I guess it's a small detail in a in a big saga. It is, it is. Mm. Like when we're all taught as children that Alfred burned the cakes. Alfred burned the cakes. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, just a few questions that I'm kind of asking everybody to, okay. to end the thing <laughs> is, do you think you could survive on a Viking Age diet? Yes. You do? Yep. That was easy. That was very <laughs> easy. Um, given that Vikings ate meat, bread, vegetables, I think I can survive on that. Okay. It's pretty much what I eat these days, to be honest. So to follow on from that, mm. is there anything from from now that you'd miss on a Viking Age diet? Well, as I'm, hmm, possibly a potato. A potato? Okay. Mm. But the Vikings do go to America. So they might have had. <laughs> <laughs> if well, the had gone to America, I might have had potatoes. <laughs> you may, may well have, I guess. That's something we can't say for sure. Uh, uh, no, yeah. It's one of my favourite foods, so potatoes. Potatoes. It's an interesting answer. I've had a few so far, and I think largely it's coffee or sugar. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, I don't drink much coffee, and I can, I'm can i quite happy with honey rather than sugar. So you'd be all right. So I'd be fine. Cool. Especially with your apple and walnut cakes. Yeah. <laughs> Those are good. <laughs> and the oat cakes. The Those oat are cake. pretty good as well. Well, if we do a quick wrap up, um, okay. and then you can carry on eating. Oh, fair <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> I won't take up too much of your time. So um, where can people find you and follow you online, that sort of thing? Okay, so we've got a website, shaftsburyabbey.org.uk. Yeah. Um, we're also on Facebook, the Shaftsbury Abbey Museum and Gardens. And 
I think the Instagram page is the same, Shaftesbury Abbey Museum and Gardens. Okay. I'll make sure I pop some links underneath so people That'd can find it. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you and, for coming on. And yeah. And everybody who's watching, please come and visit Shaftesbury Abbey. We will be open again in March. <laughs> Perfect. If you enjoyed the show and want to hear more, remember to like and subscribe and give the show a rating. You can also help keep the show going by becoming a Patreon where you'll get early access to all episodes. Or check out my range of merch on my store. Links are in the episode description. Thanks for watching. <laughs>